Hello, and welcome to Exploring Global Problems, a podcast where we talk to academics from Swansea University, whose groundbreaking research is tackling global challenges, from health innovation to sustainable futures and the environment, from digital technologies to clean energy. My name is Sam Blacksland, and today I'm joined by Yamni Nigam, Professor of Biomedical Science at the College of Human and Health Sciences at Swansea University. Yamni researches wounds and antimicrobial resistance. She and her research teams have discovered a new antibiotic from the secretion of a maggot that kills many resistant strains of bacteria. Yamni, welcome to Exploring Global Problems. Thank Good to you. see you. Hello. Yeah. Right, before we start talking about um, this really interesting stuff uh, around maggots, can you just give us uh, a very uh, brief overview of the big global problems and challenges that you are trying to grapple with? Of course, yeah. So um, one of our the, the grand challenges, if you like, of society at the moment is this very complex issue of antimicrobial resistance. We know that we are running out of antibiotics, and this is a huge global issue. It is not just a, a local UK problem. Um, the world is very seriously in trouble. We are on this, uh, we're heading towards, in fact, rolling towards a global global catastrophe of finding that we are losing the battle against bacteria. Bacteria have learnt to fight all our known antibiotics at the moment and there are several diseases at the moment where we have absolutely nothing. For example, in the UK we've got nothing against gonorrhea and nothing against chlamydia. We've lost that. There are no antibiotics that work against that and all over the world this is happening with, with strains of bacteria. So we, we and, and there are no new antibiotics being developed in earnest so I think we are, we are really in a in very dangerous waters. And why exactly are these bacteria you know, developing a resistance to antibiotics. What's the what's the scientific reason for it? They're they're, they're evolving. They're mutating. And when when um, organisms mutate, they will learn to deal with something that previously was um, able to destroy them. Uh, whether it's through working through cell membranes or some uh, perhaps we've got antibiotics that um, try and stop bacterial division. The bacteria learn to combat a way that they can bypass that, and so on. So so. You know, it's 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 the mode of action of antibiotics that the bacteria are no longer susceptible to, um, and therefore they can survive. And and we've got this this problem now. And you mentioned gonorrhea being a particular problem in the UK. What other problems might be we might we be dealing with? I think you know I, I read about wounds being a problem too. Yeah, absolutely. So we are now finding that uh, whereas uh, we would find um, infections within a wound would be treatable, would be would be certainly you'd be able to give a patient systemic antibiotics and, and they might be able to treat, treat the infection. But now we're finding that we have wounds that are certainly not being moved in the amount of infection that we have on them. And and if you don't if you don't um, get rid of the bio burden, which is the amount of bacteria you have in a wound, you don't progress to healing. You cannot help that patient's wound to heal. And so the number of resistant infections in wounds are now uh, becoming more and more apparent and, and more obvious. So in a worst case scenario, what what kind of problems might we be facing? Are we talking people, you know, just dying all over the place because they simply can't be cured of things that should be treatable. That that that's that's a very real possibility. I think my, my students often ask me, what do you think will be sort of the end of the world, the end of humanity? And mm. my answer is always this that humanity if, if humanity survives through the antimicrobial crisis, it'll be great. It'll be amazing. But but the chances of uh, you know being wiped out by bacteria is really very, very high because bacteria are just going to be flourishing in their antimicrobialness, you know, in their resistance. So it isn't good. Work must make you quite a pessimistic person then. <laughs> it does, yes, I'm afraid. Well, it does and it does. I mean, the, we hope that governments will realise that things need to be done. And I think already there's a huge move to try and prevent people overusing antibiotics, to try and look at the use of antibiotics in agriculture. And uh, the big thing that needs to happen is the drive to fund new antibiotics. That that has to happen, and at the moment, big pharma are not really interested in in funding the development of new antibiotics. And do you say people are overusing them or using them perhaps when they shouldn't be? That contributes to the problem. That has been, and I think you know we've been using antibiotics for willy nilly for for decades, um, and the, the realization has really sort of dawned on us now that it's going to be such a serious problem if we don't stop doing that. So you would stand by your uh, phrasing it as a global catastrophe or a potential global catastrophe? It, uh, absolutely. Indeed, it is. We are on, on the verge of that. Um, I saw that you said that there could be big problems for diabetics as well. 
Okay, so one of the things with uh, patients that have diabetes, and of course we know that diabetes is just escalating in, 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 our, in our society worldwide, it's becoming a huge, a huge global thing, um, is that one of the complications of diabetes is the development of chronic wounds or ulcers. Now, once a patient develops a chronic ulcer and has diabetes, it's a huge problem for them to progress to heal that because there's circulatory issues, there's problems with um, the amount of white blood cells, uh, or good cells that a, a patient has that might help to deal with that infection. And, and, and so um, what happens when a wound develops, the chances of it becoming inve infected are very, very high and the chance of a patient with diabetes being able to cure that are, are pretty non-existent. And so we are having... Um, escalating diabetes, escalating antibacterial resistance, and the two together are going to be a huge, serious, have serious implications. Might this be particularly problematic for people with type 1 or 2 diabetes or both? Um, it, it's quite often with type 2 diabetes. Mm. Um, type 1 has its own uh, complications, quite sure. more serious complications, but type 2 diabetes is far more common in, in society, and particularly with elderly patients. Um, and I think that that's, we're looking at the development of chronic wounds for, for those sort of patients, really. So this is where you come in and your work comes in, and particularly your uh, maggot therapy stuff. So Tell us what you're doing here at Swansea. Okay, so, um, right, so I, I started researching uh, um, maggots, I think about age eight, 1998. We set up at the Swansea University Maggot Research Group because um, I was developing a module on wounds to teach the students and, and I realised then that something called maggot therapy was sort of poking its head um, uh, uh, up. And what was actually happening was that maggot therapy had been something that had been used in the 30s and 40s in America and Canada and it actually worked very well well to, he um, to help wounds. So, so what we're talking about in essence is the use of a tiny living um, maggot, a baby maggot, tiny, tiny little thing that's placed onto the wound with, with lots and lots of other little baby maggots. And literally in about four days, those maggots will work to clear away all the dead tissue. Now, if you don't clear away dead tissue off a wound, you don't progress to healing. So they can do that very, very quickly, very, very efficiently. And they can also disinfect a wound. And, and that needs to happen before a wound can progress to healing. Um, and, and so that we, we, nobody really knew how maggots did this. So we set up to try and find out how that was actually happening. Um, and of course, maggot therapy had, had gone out of fashion, if you like, when antibiotics became mass produced and they became mass produced in the 40s. Mm -hmm. So even though maggot therapy worked brilliantly, um, nobody wanted to use it. If you, you can pop a pill, you know, take, a, take an antibiotic. Um, but then because of this thing that you mentioned, the resistant infections, people are thinking, well, we can't treat this patient with antibiotics. So let's look at maggots. So in the 80s and 90s, that's what happened both in America and the UK. Uh, people began looking at maggots again. Yeah, before we talk about that, can you just say a little bit more about the historic precedent? You know the the stuff the treatment was done that was done in the twenties and thirties. Yes, indeed. So so um, it was uh, an orthopedic surgeon, William Baer, actually is a pioneer of maggot therapy. He was a field surgeon in World War Two, and he found soldiers coming um, to his battlefield stations with who had bullet wounds, but they were they were swarming with maggots um, from an artificial infestation. And he would he'd looked at the wound and he looked at the patient, and the wound was brilliant. It was healthy. It was healing. There was no pyrexia, no infection, no fever. And so he went back to his laboratories after the, the war ended and he thought, well, hang on a minute, I've seen this work in soldiers' wounds. Why don't I rear maggots and put them into my patients who had osteomyelitis, who had quite severe chronic infections? And he did to a huge success. So uh, by the end of the 30s, it was being used in 300 hospitals in America and Canada, you know, and people were raving about its success. Britain at this time didn't really want to know much about it. They were like, "Ooh, it'll never, it'll never take shape here because nobody likes maggots and every, everyone finds that disgusting." So it didn't actually reach our shores until now, until the eighties and nineties, really. And are we back to, in practical terms, putting maggots directly onto wounds? Then, so so we have many therapies that try and help patients who have chronic wounds. Um, in nineteen, no, in two thousand and four, the government here put them on NHS prescription, um, and of course, in, in now it's a worldwide thing. People are, are rearing; they have to be clinical grade maggots. They have to be maggots of a particular species of fly, which is the green bottle fly, Lucilia sericata. You can't use any old maggot from a bit of sewage or a bit of poo. You have to actually have them reared, uh, specially and 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 aseptically, so that they are they're as sterile as they can be when they're put onto onto patients' wounds. Um, so. 
we we have to use those sort of maggots. Okay. And um, just a couple of terms here, because you talked about chronic wounds. Yes. I've read about necrotic yes. wounds as well. Yes. Can we maybe just unpick some of these and say what they mean? So necrosis is simply when a wound has dead tissue in it, okay. and that's a necrotic wound. A chronic wound is something that will, it, it's not an acute wound. An acute wound is a burn, a cut, a graze. Um, we're talking about a chronic wound, which is usually the result of some sort of underlying pathology like diabetes mm. or like vascular disease, which leads to venous leg ulcers. Or indeed, you've probably heard of pressure ulcers. They're, they're like one of the big things at the moment for, for, for us, certainly in our hospitals and in our, you know, with our immobile patients, that they, 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 if, you, if they're immobile for periods of time, they will develop a pressure ulcer. And that's a chronic wound that will take a while to heal. That will take, and, and that's been around for about three months. I think that's what terms it, it's, um, determines its chronicity. Okay. How far down the road are you with this research then? What have you discovered? So we have found many, many different things. We've discovered that um, the maggots themselves do there is a science to, to exactly what they're doing in a wound. So we we know, and this has been research researched um, in Nottingham University mainly, that um, the maggots produce enzymes and those enzymes um, pretty much completely digest the necrotic tissue. So the dead tissue is cleared within a couple of days. The work at Swansea has actually focused on the, the antimicrobial factors that maggots produce. And we know that they produce those externally. Um, a, a lot of the time people thought, well, when maggots are feeding on dead tissue, and incidentally, maggots have no teeth, so they can't bite the tissue. They're literally um, releasing a secretion of enzymes and that turns the whole tissue into a soup and then they drink the dead tissue back up. OK, so w w with antimicrobial factors, w we wanted to know whether any of those were externally produced. And that was the focus of our work. And we discovered that absolutely, yes, maggots are producing this secretion that is, goes all over their bodies and it comes out and it sits in the wound. And it's in the secretion that we find really brilliant, potent antimicrobial factors that we know will kill species of bacteria. And I've got more questions about all of this, but <laughs> before we move on secretion oh yeah maggot okay, secretion yeah. <laughs> etc let's just deal shall we directly with the fact that this all sounds a bit yucky it's it is well we, uh, the, when i talk to the media about this they make me call it maggot spit and sweat <laughs> because it, and that's exactly what it is it is spit and sweat still doesn't make it sound much better uh, though, does it, it? <laughs> it, it, it especially when you collect a sterile batch of secretions it's lovely it's yeah. it doesn't smell it doesn't have mm -hmm. a like it's not um, slimy in any way it's just a watery solution of their secretions yeah <laughs> It must be a barrier, though, sometimes. I mean, you said about um, in the 40s or, or earlier that it didn't actually make it to the UK because no. people were squeamish about this idea. Absolutely. There must be some squeamishness still now. Yeah. So, so um, with the research at Swansea University, we've, we've published lots and lots of work on the science behind it. And we know that there's a brilliant scientific and clinical evidence base. But we came across a problem. And the problem was that uh, it, was, it was apparent that people did not want to use maggots. And this was known, and in the literature, just, just you know, in the last decade, people have talked about it as the yuck factor. If you offer a patient maggots for their wound, um, because you can see that the wound is perfectly suitable for maggot therapy, the patient will m most of the time probably turn around and say, no, I don't want that. Or even if they want it, because a lot of patients are quite desperate to have their wound, you know, sorted and, and healed, then when they mention it to their families or their friends, it's, it's very much a no, uh, you know, not something that people want to go down that you know, go down the road of larval therapy or maggot therapy. And with larval therapy, uh, I don't know, say, for example, I was in hospital with a, with a wound and I was going to be treated in this way. Yeah. What, how would that actually happen? What would, the, what would the process be? Would somebody come along and just put this stuff on my leg or whatever? Yeah, so th this is actually very interesting because there are two ways, sorry, there are two ways that you can apply maggot therapy. The first, which was the, the, the traditional way, was it, we call it free range. You literally have a pot of maggots, you, you put a bit of saline, some salt water into that pot, and you tip them onto the wound. The wound is ready, it's prepared so that you've got um, a dressing around it, and then you pour those maggots on, um, and then you literally seal that up with a breathable dressing. And then that, that was great. Um, but Often patients didn't like that idea. The clinicians themselves wouldn't, you know, especially in the wound care in the UK certainly is nurse-led and nurses often felt they didn't want to do that. They'd rather find another dressing rather than go down the maggot therapy road. Um, and then the company that in the UK that makes maggots devised a bag called the maggot bag, the larval, the bio bag it's called. But, and that tea bag contains maggots and because they don't have teeth, 
maggots can feed through it. They can spit out their secretions through it, and then they can digest the food and then drink it back up. So the bag works really, really well. And the bag is literally just plate, taken out with forceps and put onto the patient's wound. And again, there's a breathable dressing put on top of it. And is this regularly done in hospitals across the country? I would like to think that it's more regularly done than it is. It, it, it is certainly in in some... I mean, I go to podiatry in Morrison Hospital quite a lot, and I sit there with the podiatrists, and they have seen it work, and they will use it regularly because it works so well. Um, and it, is, it does. It does happen. I mean, it's, it's there as an open sort of... Um, it's, it's there on the NHS as a treatment, but it is patient compliance. You know, it's like saying that... Um, it's like having a patient who would say, no, I, I met a couple of patients who I talked to about, about this, and in a car park and they said oh yeah we were offered maggot therapy we said no and I said well why did you say no and one of them said oh I'm, I was scared they'd eat me alive which again is a myth that we have to sort of educate people into understanding that can't happen um, these maggots only eat unhealthy dead tissue they can't eat they will starve on healthy tissue so we know that, that that wouldn't happen and the second reason was oh i i was scared they would turn into flies on me that's a real fear for people and we've done masses of surveys where we've discovered that people are scared that you put larvae on maggots on they they will fly off you as flies and again we know that that can't happen because of the life cycle stages you know the the life cycle needs completion of two or three weeks before we go from larva to pupa to adult um and that won't happen on a patient. No, that's, clinic, that's under clinical supervision. And obviously all the science behind this is sound and it's very complicated, but I guess it looks and feels quite rudimentary to some people and maybe that puts them off. It's nature. It's it's fundamentally nature. Yeah, and it is. And and I, I've spoken to many um, senior doctors who have said, well, that's medieval. You know, we, we don't do that anymore. We've got other things. And so there are many barriers, as, as you said, you know, and one of them is that it's a very traditional, almost alternative um, form of medicine in many people's eyes. And the fact that there is a scientific basis and a sound clinical evidence base for it is is neither here nor there for many people. But are there barriers from within the medical profession then? Yes. Yes, unfortunately so, yeah. Um, not just the barriers, you know, in terms of, oh, well, surely we've got something better or something else um it's squeamishness we have we have a whole we are all human you know whether we're a nurse or a doctor or a consultant or, or whatever you ha we are somewhere along the line we we learn disgust and we learn that maggots in particular are disgusting either we see them on some rubbish or we see a dead rat in the garden that's swarming with maggots and you immediately have you associate them with decay and with decomposition and in fact it's the opposite because maggots really are working to try and and get rid of the, the 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 dead animal, or get rid of the, to, try, to sort of try and um, uh, decompose it in in a really you know a proper way, so that you know it's a whole life, it's a cycle of life, isn't it? Um, so so yeah, so we have we are up against it big time. I'm uh, I'm imagining this bag of maggots on me, and I'm wondering what it feels like. Uh, can you feel them moving? Um, and would it even hurt? Okay, so we, we um, maggots that go on in a bag are, are put on as tiny little L1 stages, small, small maggots that at the very start don't, you can't feel the sensation of them, but they will grow. And over the four days, because they are feeding on dead tissue, they are going to grow from being one millimetre in size to probably being about a centimetre. And at, at some point during that time, patients claim that they can, they have the sensation of wriggling. So they, 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 they expect that. Pain is a different um, a different thing altogether because a lot of patients who have chronic wounds, especially patients who are um, have diabetes, have what we call peripheral neuropathy. Mm -hmm. They have a, a condition where you can't actually feel the surface of the of the wound, and usually if it's on the foot, then then they 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 often have that. So in that case, they might not have any sensation at all. So they they don't. Other patients, in my experience, have said it doesn't hurt at all, and yet other patients have said, oh. It really hurts. Can you please take it off? So there's a huge psychological um, p pain, as you know, is not just purely physiological. There's a, there's a whole psychological component as well. And what some researchers have actually found is that if a patient is really willing to have maggot therapy and wants to try it, there's less pain associated with it. And where a patient is very reluctant or scared, there's more pain associated with it. So so I think it really depends on the patient and the condition that you're trying to treat uh, treat with maggots. Is there a clinical potential for not just having these things on you, but maybe even sort of a medicinal maggot, sort of taking it, you know, 
or taking something via a pill, which has the same effect? Yeah. So what's, what, what we know is that maggots do three things. They debride a wound, they get rid of the dead tissue, they disinfect a wound, and they, and they heal a wound. Um, so having a pill that does all those three things would mean that you would need to collect all uh, the whole lot of secretions um, and perhaps design a pill that, that may work. What we're looking to do is isolating those things so that we have, uh, we have something that will just disinfect the wound, and that might be able to work work systemically as as a pill um we we do, at the moment i think the thing is if you're putting a maggot on a wound you've got a factory there of everything it's giving all the molecules um and and moreover if you were to harness just the secretions and turn those into a tablet the fact that the maggot um responds to the wound as well it, we would lose that with a pill. So, for example, if you have a, 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 a you put a maggot on a wound, it gets infected. The wound's infected. The maggot responds to that infection by increasing its molecules that are antibacterial, and you would lose that if you just had a, had a pill that wouldn't be modified or adapted in the wound. Um, so, what we know is that maggots that have their antibacterial activity is inducible, very much like us. If you have a cold we know that our bodies are going to in, uh, way increase the white blood cell count so that they will deal with the infection. Now, maggots, even though they're a bit more primitive creatures and have been around for much longer than we have, um, have evolved molecules that will do that, that will, that will adapt to the condition that they're in. Knowing what these specific maggots do, you must be now quite fond of the green bottle fly. <laughs> I love it. I, well, I'm an entomologist by training, so yeah, I, I love most insects. But um, the green bottle fly, I think, is a beautiful metallic green fly. No, not many people find them beautiful because they, we associate them with corpses and 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 um, sewage and all sorts of things. But um, I, I do. I have a huge fondness. And in my labs, when the flies are, um, I, I love walking into my labs, just looking around at my cages of uh, flies. Yeah. <laughs> Are they are they common in the UK? Will we see them? Absolutely, yeah. we see them every summer, every spring. They're 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 cosmopolitan. They're all over the world. Okay. Yeah. Back to the maggots. Um, they are TV stars, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> but this this was this was amazing. Uh, we were contacted in uh, August uh, 2018 by the producers of the BBC medical drama Casualty who were toying with the idea of, of including um, maggots in, in a storyline. So they asked me to come down and talk to scriptwriters and producers, and I gave them a little talk um, about it and, and the, whole, the whole problem of antibacterial resistance and, and so on. And a few months later, they wrote back and said, right, we are going to have four episodes of maggots, and we'd like you to sort of be the consultant on that and help write the script. And it was just brilliant. It was great. So they did, in fact, the, the four episodes aired in Feb from February to July 2019. Um, and then the BBC wanted me to interview the the main stars of the show, so I went down, and interviewed them, and I gave them some maggots to hold, and we talked about it. So yeah, maggots have uh, finally reached the big screen, really. Yeah. So these kinds of dramas really do employ or you know um, draw from specialist research like yours. I think so, and I, I think I think what was so good for us was that one of our big missions uh, with our maggot research has been to try and see if we can um, increase the uptake. And the, w one of the ways to do that is to have a public engagement campaign, which we've set up, which we've called Love a Maggot, which we f for which we have a Twitter and a Facebook account and a loveamaggot.com web web page, where we actually are trying to really promote um, or at least uh, 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 let people know what maggots are, what they do, and how they do what they do. Um, and so there's a public engagement campaign and this was the brilliant thing about casualty whereas i go out and speak to the public and and maybe talk to a couple of hundred thousand people four and a half million people watch casualty every episode so that was fab it was going to be my next question to say that no 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 it's great but um you know we as academics we strive to get lots of research in very you know uh, respectable journals and yeah. all that kind of stuff but actually yeah. if you want a public health message to get out there, yeah. then a major show on the BBC is surely one of the best ways of doing it. I, th I think so. I think we've, you know, we, we're very fortunate that uh, that they took it on board and they also ran with it. And and th what what they did was they they gave the maggot storyline to their most popular consultant, Dylan, and that that who's a quirky fellow at best. And and so that that's what people really loved about it. You know, if you look at the Twitter feeds and so on afterwards, that people were you know quite enthralled by. It. Although the Daily Mail did say maggots on casual. Well, not at tea time, surely. I thought, well, it's casualty, you know, casualty has got horrible things in it and, and that, whatever. Anyway, they picked on the fact that maggots shouldn't have been shown at tea time. And did the storyline in question have a, if not a happy ending, then a sort of a positive message, clearly? 
Yeah, yeah, and and I, and one of my my um sty- things that I actually said to the producers at the time was, you know, we had and, and the scripts were coming to me, and I was rewriting them so that they would be way more positive than. And they kept telling me, well, we're not a documentary, we're a drama, so we have to, you know, make it out to be. Re-. But but absolutely, yeah, we had a really r- brilliant positive messages coming out of it. And did the characters in the drama were there people who suffered from the sort of the yuck factor? Were, were there people who initially <laughs> didn't want this to happen to them? I I, I did ask. Ask the the stars of the show about it, and neither of them felt a particularly yuck factor okay. to it. They did say that some of the cameramen, when they were putting maggots on the patients, were were a little bit squeamish um, about it. But the actual actors who had maggots put on them were, were fine. So, let's talk a little bit more about these public campaigns then, um, mm-hmm. and the way that you spread your important message. Um, yeah, the love a maggot yeah. campaign. Uh, when was that established, and what does it involve? Uh, the the Love Maggot campaign came about because one day I had applied for a grant to further the science of our research, and one of the referees' comments was, "Your science is sound, but nobody wants to use maggots." And I thought, "Right, is that really the case?" And so that's the first thing we did. This was 2016. We decided to find out by doing a huge 500 online survey of people. We asked a lot of questions, and we discovered that actually, yes. They, the referee was right. People didn't. If you, if you asked somebody, would you use maggots? They were. Like, there was a thirty percent would say all right. The remaining seventy were not interested, uh, and so we knew then we had issues with with trying to trying to promote it. A lot of the reasoning behind that was that people didn't know how they worked. There was no uh, there was no understanding or knowledge. So we thought, all right, this is what we have to do. We have to inform, and one of the ways to inform is a public engagement uh, campaign, which is why we launched Love a Maggot and why. You know, I tend to go all over the place now talking about it. We, we're doing something at Swansea Science Festival. We, you know, there, there are things all the time where they want the maggot exhibition and the maggot stand. And we, we ask people to feel maggots. Um, and it is, it's actually amazing. I'll tell you a little story about um, uh, a, a one festival that I was at where I was sh- a, 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 a young man arrived with two small boys who were like sort of dragging him uh, to the maggot stand. And he was saying, no, no, I'm not coming. I'm not going near you. Um and the boys were, Dad, please. Um, and so he he looked at me from a distance and says, what are you doing? What are you doing with those maggots? And I said, well, you know, we're, we're trying to show people that we can use them to help treat wounds. And he said, oh, no, 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 God, no. And the boys came forward and I started talking to them and showing them the maggots. And he was sort of edging closer and closer. And then after a while, he said, what do they do in wounds? And so I explained. He said, they can actually help treat a wound I said, yeah they can they can actually you know we, we've and I, i've got images clinical images where i show clo- wound closure and so on he was like oh my god he then stood there for the, I, the next half an hour wanting to know everything about them knew all about them thanked me walked away came back and wanted to shake hands and you just thought you've got through to somebody who wouldn't even come near them but simply by engaging with them and, and showing them you know the baby maggots the, the flies and whatever and explaining what they can do you, you've sold somebody and so if he ever needed maggots uh, or need and this this is what we tend to ask people so if you were offered maggots as therapy now having seen what they can do and how they do it what would you do and they're like of course I would I would go with it and, and that's really what it's about and on those one-to-one basis, bases, obviously that's fantastic because you can convince people yeah. directly. But obviously, there's a you want to try and make this bigger and broader, don't you? As a, a sort of a, a much more of a nationwide campaign to really Ideally, spread the message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, apart from casualty, I don't know um, how much further we can go with that because a lot of people don't, you know, are like, still like, Ugh, you know, don't well, maggots. No, no, don't want anything to do with those. How far afield do you take, you know, your work and research? Where do you talk to people? So, so, so my. Re- so my the research has taken different avenues. Public is one avenue. Then we have clinicians. So we 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 know that nurses are a lot of um, nurses are not happy to use them. So I go out now Europe wide giving seminars on on maggots. Um, and and the, the and the, the third the third avenue really is trying to get it into primary school education. And that's, so there's three strands to the research that we're doing. Um, so we try and take it as far wide as possible. At the moment, it's Wales. So I've managed to get maggot therapy established in every single nurse curriculum in Wales. So all nurses that will graduate from Wales will have had a two-hour session hands-on with maggots. So when they go out onto the wards as a nurse, they are not going to turn around and say, well, I don't want to use that because they've already learned about it, known about it and had their squeamishness tackled. So that's something that's, that, that's happening. And of course, trying to get it 
trying to get established into schools to say that no, the honeybee is not the only brilliant insect. We, you know, medicinal maggots are actually way up there and can do so much. So I'm working on trying to do that now in primary schools. So do you work with a particular organisation or a or a foundation, or have you set up anything that specifically goes into schools to talk about this, or is it just you? It, 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 it used to be just me. Uh, now I've t- I'm talking with, with the Welsh Government, and we're trying to put it in as a resource pack for all teachers in Wales. So it'll go into what they call their hub, which is a, which is like a, 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 um, a, set, a set of resource packs for teachers. Who, but, but the brilliant thing about it is it's linked to the global challenge. And one of the grand challenges that the Welsh government is introducing into the new curriculum is, is um, antibacterial resistance. So it sort of fits in really, really well with that. Do you know what other kind of grand challenges they've introduced? I'm just trying to think what this, what your particular issue sits alongside. You know, what is it similar to in the eyes of the Welsh government. Yes, yeah, so climate change is a big one, um, and it's it's that sort of thing. Sustainable energy, um, uh, yeah. Th- th- I think there are six grand challenges they've identified, but certainly antibacterial resistance is is a major one. What about your travels in Europe? Then where have you gone, and who have you spoken to? Okay, so I have been um, to Copenhagen, and I've talked to groups of uh, medics and, and 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 nurses. I've been um, into Germany. I've been into f- France. Um, so, so it's 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 whenever people ask me to come to come across, um, usually they set up days, maggot days, or set set up maggot events. I I, I would do that. I'd go, I'd go out there and, and talk, um, and, and not just talk. You know, I'd take up things with me that I could show people. Um, so yeah, the, the, Europe is quite good because there are a lot. There's a lot of interest and a lot of research going on in Europe as well, where they um, where they want to use maggots more in wounds. Have you had any particularly positive experiences from visiting a place in a particular country? Yes. Um, again, in in um, when I was in uh, in Copenhagen, th- there was a group of I, I was uh, doing a day of maggots, and there were doctors, there were nurses, and at lunchtime they were all chatting, and I got feedback that two of them had ad- identified a patient who they didn't know what to do with, and having that morning discovered that they could put maggots on it they decided that they would do that for the patient so it was just almost immediate it was like okay so you you've gone out to speak to somebody and two physicians two two doctors have decided that they are going to start using it that afternoon on somebody and i just thought that that was great because that that um they were at their wits end with the patient whose wounds just hadn't healed and um i i, I didn't follow it up but i i just thought that that was really brilliant that you know you you get a message out there and people who can do immediately sort of think all right i'm going to i'm going to use maggots on this patient mm. Is it worth stressing here that this isn't a case of you're designing um, a therapy or or a, a way of dealing with things to uh, to try and deal with things that might happen? This is stuff that is happening now. The, 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 certain medications are yeah. not working now. Yes. And actually, yeah. this is a therapy that people can use immediately and yeah. it might have positive effects. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You're, you're you're so right. Um, we we struggle to get that message out there that you know we have patients with wounds that aren't being that are stagnant for two years, and and there's nothing that's shifting that along. Maggots will change that, turn it around in four days, and they will not only turn a wound that's that's um, completely not going anywhere in, in and, and clean it and disinfect it. It'll actually kickstart healing. Mm. So yeah, we, we we know that that happens. There's so much evidence for that. Is it a case of will or might? Are there certain wounds that it won't work on? If you've got to be, have you got to focus this quite particularly? Yeah, the wound has to be assessed to check mm. that it's okay. A very dry wound is not suitable for maggots, um, and it's got to have you know it's got to have dead tissue. Obviously, if it's a wound that's past the heal, past the necrotic stage, then maggots won't there won't be any any good good on it so so and, and in some cases and i have talked to nurses who've said this this particular wound had um strep g infection which is a strain of bacteria that's notoriously bad and maggots died as a result of it because they themselves couldn't deal with that infection so we're not it, it's not an evangelical thing that unfortunately <laughs> there are situations where maggots won't work but there are also many situations where maggots will and perhaps are just not being used in those situations as yet Tell us about you then. How did you get into this line of research? What's your background? My background was I loved 
in, in, from a very young age, anything to do with the human body. So I was just crazy about learning. I, I was fascinated, really, with how we work and how every bit of us works. Um, and, and, and about 16, I try and, tried to choose all the biology options I possibly could at A-level. I set up a junior science club so that um, other girls, I was at girls' school, other girls in younger years could come along and I would, you know, I would, I would do things with them biologically related and, and medically related. And then I also began to fall in love with insects. And uh, both of those two things were my major passions so, so there was a human body and there was there were in, there were insects and so of course when I, when I did my first degree um, at, at King's in London I took all the entomology options and took all the human structure and function options and I really just did my whole degree based on those two things um, and and that's really what I've, I've sort of expanded on so I did my master's in medical entomology and parasitology and then um, did my doctorate on tropical diseases so insects that affect humans in, in that sense and um, and I looked at um, I went to Brazil to work for about four months so that I, I worked on a, on Chagas disease which is a disease that's caused by insects and it was only then in in when I got to Swansea that that whole thing turned on its head and we, I stopped looking at insects that were bad for humans and I started looking at insects that were really good for humans i.e the medicinal maggot this is a very broad question um but what qualities do you think you need to be to be a scientist? What makes a good scientist? All right. Okay. I Well, of course you have to be curious. You have to want to find out and discover things. But my advice to everybody that ever says to me, I, I, you know, I don't know what I really want to do. I like science, but I don't know, is, is to find the one thing that you love or that interests you so much that you know that you, you wouldn't be bored ever of it. And I think, I think that's key. Science won't work if you're bored with what you're looking at. You have to be so interested in it that, that it, it's infectious, that you just want to know more and more and more about it. And I think that's the key to it. Find something that you've got a passion for, um, and and that and that will drive you. Even if things don't go well for you, if you still love it, you carry on trying to find a way to do it, or trying to find a way around around it, so you can do it. You know, so that would be the main thing I would say: perseverance, curiosity. Yeah, it's the main thing. Are there other people around the world working on similar things to you? Do you collaborate with other people? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So the, the, in the UK, there's only one other group, which is in Nottingham and David Pritchard's group. And I've collaborated uh, you know, on occasions with with him and we've published stuff together. Um, and then we we formed a European maggot research group in Leiden, in Holland. And that, um, that, that collaborated with people there and we've worked together with people there and published with people there as well. So yeah, I'm, we're, this, this is great. It, it's, it's fantastic. There are little pockets of maggot researchers. Not, not very many. There, it's just a few. America's quite big. There's this Sherman's group in America is really quite big. Um, but yeah, we, we, we try and work as, as, together as much as we can. That's, that's important. And you said that big farm is not particularly interested in this at the moment. Is that just because there's no money in it? Mm. Big pharma are all about making money. So if you have a drug that is going to cure, is going to help patients' um, symptoms of a long-term chronic disease like like dementia or um, some other long-term chronic condition, big pharma are interested because there's loads of money in that. If you're working to produce an antibiotic, if you want to put money into funding the production of an antibiotic, which someone will use for a week and then won't use again, there's not much money in that. And so this, herein lies the problem. There's no dollar signs for big pharma with, with the production of a new antibiotic. In terms of health, we're desperate. We need new antibiotics. But there isn't any interest in big pharma to actually put in the money to produce and it's costly to produce a new drug because of all the trials and all the tests and so on. Um, and they're just not interested enough to put money down for it. And that, that, that's why we're finding ourselves in this situation. We should probably explain for people listening exactly what we mean by big pharma and about the fact that there are you know, relatively few, very big companies, aren't there, who yeah. supply yeah. Um, drugs to organisations like the NHS. Yes. So we're talking about the big drug producing companies um, who... Uh, are, are possibly the ones that could take this sort of thing forward, the development of a new antibiotic, um, but are reluctant to do so. Because in the normal process, say here in the UK, um, the NHS might want to supply certain drugs to people. Mm -hmm. um, 
And how does it decide what it supplies? Because is this where NICE comes in, the Institute for Clinical Excellence? Yeah. Um, they have, there's a drug formulary that all um, clinicians have to sort of, that's the choice that they have. They can't pick any old drug from random. The NHS has got a procedure where there's procurement and, and so on. So mm. on. Um, but uh, maggots are not a licensed drug. They are available on the NHS as off-license. So this is one of the things NICE have not um, produced any guidelines on maggot therapy because they haven't. It isn't a licensed uh, medicine, and the companies that make maggots um, can't afford to go down the road of of, produ of going down the licensing route. I think it's just been granted license in Germany, but in the UK we 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 have it as an off off license off label uh, medicine, uh, even though it's available and it's on prescription, and that's absolutely fine. So could you collect this from the pharmacy then? In theory, uh, no, it has to be ordered. Um, I, I, I think if you went for it as a private prescription, um, you might be able to get it directly from the company. But I'm, I'm not so sure about that aspect of it. I try not to deal with the company issues because you know we're at the university are about the research, and um, you know you maintain your integrity by not sort of working with a company to see what what it's doing. It's it's purely our sort of science and investigations that we're carrying out. Understood. Although I guess it's useful to at least. Um have that awareness that it's yeah. not simple it doesn't the science doesn't necessarily then flow into the supply of absolutely drugs. not absolutely not and, and that's something we are having to talk to clinicians about who say actually you know what i, I want to use maggots but there's a factor where where do i go how do i do it do i go to pharmacy do i go to who do, who prescribes it and so all these things need to be sort of there needs to be a proper protocol for all of this um, obviously, the nurses that know how to do it will carry on using it and, and that's great but yeah there are other factors involved and in its use. I'm sensing sort of two sides to this discussion that we're having, one of which is hugely optimistic and very hopeful, but also one that recognises uh, enormous challenges as part of your research. And you've talked about, well, what we've just discussed, yeah. um, but also the yuck factor, yeah, yeah. this real, real resistance from some people to get involved with, with all of this. But what other challenges do you think you face in this line of work? I think you, you've hit the nail on the head, really, with the with the, the main challenge being that people have learnt that maggots are not a good thing. When you put a maggot on a, a three year old's hand, they're like, "Oh wow, this is gorgeous!" And then when you go up the scale, and we've done our research on that, by the age of like nine, they are like, "Ew." Ugh. So somewhere along that, those that three to nine, very young formative years, people, those kids, have learnt that maggots are actually not something to be wowed at they're actually they associate them then with something very negative and that to me is a big challenge is we we've got to make sure that maggots are not seen as negative that they are somehow whether it's primary school education which is what i'm trying to do you know you explain everything about the medicinal maggot to nine-year-olds before they they formulate their opinions that no actually i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go down the road of hating maggots because we associate them with uh, with disgust or whatever. Um, so that that honestly, that has become the major challenge for me. The other challenge, of course, was funding. You know, we as as a scientist, it's uh, it's been very hard to progress in the science because the funding has come and gone, come and gone. You have a little bit and then it stops. And all the scientists, all my RAs, have been trained up and working on the science, and then suddenly there's no more funding. So they go, and then the fresh batch arrives when I get more funding. So that's very tricky. Does the future look bright for funding? Um, I mean, you mentioned the Welsh government. The Welsh government funded um, this work greatly, and Welsh government and Europe, Europe, European Union funded um, the work in the development of the new antibiotic that we we're trying to take forward. Um, Sratsin, we've trademarked it at Swansea University, and we've called. You know, we are working with other universities to try and isolate this and and purify it, and so we have a molecule that we can perhaps create ourselves in the lab, so that this is the maggot molecule that's that that kills so many different strains of uh, of bacteria. Um, but the funding, even for this has not been forthcoming very readily, apart from a big grant by the Welsh Government a few years ago. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? I'm always optimistic, always. But I, but I think that the message needs to be out there. And I think the future is going to be fine, but we do need to act like, like in everything, like climate change, like you know sustainable energy, like electric cars. They're all positive, brilliant things. Um, and, and, but we, we need to make sure that we are sort of working working along the same lines, really, to try and uh, get these more natural therapies into, 
into mainstream health and science. You've made it very clear that you are not squeamish about maggots and that other people shouldn't be and that they're a fantastic thing. Are you squeamish about anything else, though? <laughs> oh, God, that's a good question. Um, no, I don't think I am. Oh, I don't like um, people vomiting around me. Sorry. Yeah. I, I will immediately throw up if someone is throwing up next to me. <laughs> <laughs> which was difficult when I was um, raising my two children <laughs> but uh, yeah or if ever you're on a uh, in, in a hospital on a ward I guess as well. might, yeah, in some cases in acute wards yeah for yeah. sure for sure yeah now I've read um, that you have said that people should uh, find an area of study that makes them buzz and yeah. I think there's probably a slight pun intended <laughs> there uh, but there will be people listening to this probably who think that very much they're, they're not squeamish and they mm. like what they're hearing and they want to get into your line of work Right. Um, what would you say to those people and how would you encourage them to, you know, be like you? Well, that, that, that would be brilliant. I'm all for encouraging people to, to, to go into this, this line of work. I don't think we know enough about insects at all. I think the technology that science has come up with in recent years has now enabled us to find out more. So I think that's really important. I think if you are, if you're, if you're interested in maggots, if you're interested in insects in any way, shape or form, you must make sure you take as many courses as you can that will help you with that, that will guide you with that. Um, and then the, progressing along, if you're still in love with it by the time you've done a degree in it, then then taking that further to, to into research would be fantastic because the amount of different things we've got at our fingertips now that we can use to analyze uh, insect um, secretions, insect optic lobes, insect the way insects breathe, the way they, all these various things that we can find out. And of course, the genetic side of things as just the genomics of different creatures is, is, is soaring. And so, so there is such great scope with our new technology. So if you are interested in it, wow, you know, it, you will discover things that we, we wouldn't know, we would dream about discovering, you know, 20 years ago. So I think, yeah, go for it, definitely. Yam Niola, that was really interesting. Thank you so much uh, for talking to us today. Uh, thank you very much indeed. If you want to find out more about Yamni's research, you can visit loveamaggot.com or her staff profile at Swansea University's College of Human and Health Science webpage. To find out more about this podcast and Swansea University's research, visit swansea.ac.uk forward slash research. That's all from us today. Thanks for listening and thank you very much to our guest, uh, Professor Yamni Nigam. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate and review. I'm Sam Blacksland and that was Exploring Global Problems from Swansea University.